How are you doing? Adam, I'm great. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming by. Yeah. I know you, you had your um, wonderful drive into New York City to go yeah. back home. Now yeah. that you're in D.C. Only to come here and enjoy this fabulous Indian Indian meal with you. Yes. Yes. Um, so normally I do, a, I don't know if you've ever heard of Honey Grow. Does that sound familiar? No. No. All right. Should it? I don't know if it's everywhere. Because every time I bring somebody who's like from New York City, uh -huh. they're like, I've never heard of this. And they really like it. It's like noodles and stuff. But I figured this area has a very large Indian population. Oh. So it, there's a lot of Indian restaurants and stuff like that. So it's kind of the cuisine of the area. Okay, okay. Indian food, so. It's fabulous. I'm, yeah. I'm loving this, this naan. The naan? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would, would you get, you got... Um, I just got dal and rice. Dal and rice. Yeah, there you go. I just wanted something light for lunch. And I got chicken tandoori. Yeah. <laughs> so um, for people who may not be familiar with you, what do you do? So... Uh, full time. I'm with Epoch Times, mm -hmm. as you well know, since we've had you on our show, and that's how I came to to know you personally. Um, I'm a producer with American Thought Leaders, and a new show we just premiered called Fallout with Dr. Robert Malone. Oh, um, I didn't realize Dr. Malone was. Yeah, okay. yeah. He now has his um, has a new show with us on Epoch, co-hosted um, with him and Jan. Mm. Um, so, yeah, and then I do a bunch of things in the nonprofit realm, mostly related to Israel or anti-Semitism or Islamic extremism or terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked with a number of nonprofits in the past. Right now I work uh, part-time with um, Middle East Forum, and uh, I'm a fellow with the Jewish Leadership Project. Um, yeah, so just, uh, you know, I have multiple interests, and I, I kind of keep all of them running at once. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about before, you were a musician. Yes, yes, in my 20s. I, um, I majored in journalism and religious studies. I got a double degree, and then I kind of put that all aside after, uh, all aside after college, and I was like, I'm going to try the music thing. So <laughs> I was a drummer in many, many bands as well as a songwriter, and I had my own project, and it was fun in your 20s, you know, but... At some point, I kind of grew up and was, you know, ready to not be hustling anymore and have like a real career. So mm. I got into the nonprofit space. I went to grad school um, and uh, studied counterterrorism and homeland security. That's what my degree is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that, that degree. Um, but didn't really do much with that. It was actually kind of a. Um, it was kind of a pointless major, to be honest. Oh, really? um, but uh, but I'm glad I did it. It's nice to have like a graduate degree on your resume, whatever it's in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and then um, you know during the pandemic, uh, I got kind of sick of being full time in the nonprofit space because everybody started working from home then. Mm. I had been working from home for a long time, and I really didn't want to be working from home anymore. So I kind of switched into the, the broadcast journalism scene, which is kind of where I had my roots because that's what I studied in college. Right. So I was at Newsmax for a little bit, and then I went to Epoch. And okay, so you were at Newsmax first. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Newsmax is interesting. Um, I've done some appearances on Newsmax yeah. like a handful of times. Uh -huh. it's, um, it's very on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> very. Yeah, do you know... Um, Billy Prempa, Prempa? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, we always had him on my show. And I was at Newsmax. Fellow Jersey guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't, I haven't talked to him in quite some time. But I, That's I hung why out I with thought him you and, might know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually met him for the first time at America Fest. Um, I guess it's two years ago now. Or no, a little bit over a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, nice guy. Um, Seems very serious, but I think he's an example of making headway in a D plus district. Mm. You know, I haven't talked to him in quite some time, but I know he ran twice, if I remember correctly, and each time he was making advancements. And I, I think there's something he did, he did better the second time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he I used to have the numbers. So I wrote an article and I, I texted him because I wanted to use his district as an example. Um, so I don't, I don't remember, what, it went from D plus, I don't know, like 11 to D plus 5 or something like that. Okay. But he was making headway. Um, yeah. And, and my, my whole point was that these districts aren't impossible. You just have to risk losing. 
you know. Yeah. And obviously, when you're a donor, you know, you want someone who's likely going to win. So getting yeah. money to lose sounds like a ridiculous right. cause. Right. But it's the long-term goal, you know. But politics isn't always about long-term goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting you say that because um, I was just thinking of the IDF in Israel and mm. how they, uh, that country, which is, you know, I know we're going to talk about that and this might be a good segue, but it's such a an innovative uh, country, you know, they call it like the startup nation. Right. And one of the reasons is because in the IDF, everybody, you know, serves in the army and there's this, uh, I think, overall... There's this overall environment where failure is not looked at as a bad thing. It's just looked at as like a necessity to mm -hmm. get somewhere. So people are willing to like take more risks, right? And like everybody kind of puts themselves out there and tries and then fails. And they don't look at it as like a setback. They're like, okay, now try again, now try again, now try again. Right. Um, and it seems kind of like a, the same kind of uh, mentality. Is it is it one of those things where like I feel like in America we have the luxury – of being safe about a lot of things. And the people who take risks in America do really well, but there's a lot of people who want to play it safe. Mm -hmm. Like the, the successful businessmen that I've talked to, almost all of them have failed. And then they did it again, right. and then it worked out, now they're right. millionaires. Right? So there's always some sort of risk that they're taking, there's, and they usually experience some sort of failure. or non-success for a period of time and then boom things take off yeah and i feel like there's a lot of people who are very safe here um who are but they have the luxury of being safe yeah they're just they're comfortable they have just enough unless i don't want to rock the boat and maybe that's the same mentality as far as like the pandemic you know a lot of people didn't want to risk losing their job if they didn't get vaccinated yeah. or speaking out you know, because this doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, you know, get it, you know, piss off my job. And for me, personally, like I've, I've experienced a lot of struggle so that the willingness to take risk is higher for me than mm -hmm. it is for other people. So I kind of, I understand it, but I, it's something that I kind of noticed. So it's interesting that you bring up out in Israel, maybe they don't have the luxury of feeling safe because... There is yeah. always some sort of danger that's present, um, and especially because everybody's in the military, so they're aware of the danger. Whereas here, it was like five percent of the population has done military service or something, something like that. Right. So it's ver relatively small. So I don't know. I don't know if that contributes to it. Yeah. Well, what I was thinking about when you were talking was the flip side of wanting to stay safe is actually being kind of driven by fear. Right. Cause, and I and I feel like. Ironically, even though we are so safe here, people, a lot of people make their decisions based on fear. I don't think unless you're running from like a tiger that a decision should ever be made based on fear. I, right. I don't think that's like a healthy way to, you know, go about determining how you're going to live your life. But unfortunately, that's how a lot of people make their decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think probably you're, you're right. In, in, in Israel, they live with these existential threats every single day. And they just kind of push through it, you know. They don't let that that fear that fear limit them. So that definitely that definitely could contribute to their you know risk taking, you know their their that mentality of taking risks and and therefore being able to innovate and invent and create. Okay, yeah, that's what I'm thinking as well. Um, actually, I wanted to go to because you said you went, you took um, you went to grad school for counterterrorism. Yeah, what made you choose that? Yeah, in Israel. Um, oh, you you, t you were doing this in Israel. I did, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, why did I go to grad school? Well, not I'm, necessarily why you went to grad school, but like... Why did I choose why counter terrorism? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I had been working in the nonprofit space dealing with anti-Semitism and, and Israel, and I think I was just very fascinated by the phenomenon of Islamic extremism. And mm. I had grown to learn so much about that as I was studying Israel uh, and anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, 
it's also just kind of like a sexy major, right? Ooh, counterterrorism, <laughs> you know. I think it probably just had like an allure. Um, so, yeah, I think that was my, my reasoning at the time. It's hard to think back that, that long ago. But, um, I mean, I knew I, I, at that point in my life I didn't want to do journalism. That's what I had done majored in uh when I was an undergrad mm -hmm. and I didn't want to do that funny that's what I'm doing now um <laughs> but uh you know I didn't want to do that and you know I I had you know started working in nonprofits, and um I guess it just I don't know I thought maybe it would open up some some jobs you know private security or maybe even government or something because I knew I didn't want to stay in the nonprofit space forever it's not that lucrative and right you know um part yeah. of the reason I was asking because sometimes people choose something because something impacted them. Right. So like, it's kind of a, uh, some people say like, the people who get into psychology are really getting into figure themselves out mm -hmm. or, or they experience something. So right. I've actually met quite a few people who um, come from really troubled homes and they get into psychology. Right. You know, so I wasn't sure if, if there was something close to you that happened that well, pushed you towards it? there wasn't like an incident that triggered right. it. Um, not then, not like right before I went. I mean, throughout my life, um, I was certainly impacted by 9-11. Mm. Um, and, you know, as I, as I uh, learned about Israeli history, I mean, terrorism, Islamic terrorism has been such a fundamental component of that since pretty much like, you know, since a, few decades after the founding of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 1928. Hmm. Um, you know, terrorism has had such an effect on, on the lives of, of people in, in, in Israel or um, in, in the, the British mandate uh, before it was Israel and, um, and around the world. I mean, in, 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 in America, we, we actually don't think of it as such a big problem because we don't have a lot of terrorist attacks here. But like right. in places like Europe or Africa and obviously the Middle East, I mean, terrorism is a it's a it's it's a very prominent part of people's lives there's a lot more attacks there and you know i mean here we're very lucky i think we have really good intelligence and a lot of uh, terrorist attacks are foiled here so we don't even know about them you know right they they end before they start um but uh but yeah but for for whatever reason we just um it's it's not as it, it's not really at the forefront of our of our minds. We we have other stuff we're we're dealing with, but because I was studying about a region, you know, uh, studying a region that was very far away where this was a, such a problem, I think it really interested interested me. And also because I wasn't raised religious, I felt very close to my Jewish uh, roots and my my Jewish identity. But um, we were not particularly religious growing up. I was very agnostic. And um, and so the phenomenon of like religious extremism really appealed to me, hmm. um, and you know, and obviously I zoomed in on Islamic extremism again because of what we're talking about and the closeness to the region and Israel and everything. But yeah, I think that that probably was the 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 slow lead up to to deciding on that major. Okay, yeah. I know there's there's a lot of Americans who, including myself, who've never been to the Middle East, never been to Israel. I guess my I, my question for you is, what do you think is the most misunderstood thing about Israel from an American Ooh. perspective? Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's <laughs> a hard one. There's so question. many. Mm. Or you can name like top two. Let's just say. I think one of the most misunderstood elements is the IDF, is the army. I mean, the IDF is painted as this like ruthless, aggressive, right? Like just um, heartless fighting force. And when you go to Israel and you talk to the soldiers, the commanders, nothing could be further from, from, from the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, these people are, it's salt of the earth. My parents are in Israel right now and they're visiting amputees in hospitals, soldiers that have, uh, become severely injured right. in the war. And I mean, it's the stories that I'm hearing from my parents are so emotional. You know, it's, it's really one of the most meaningful things they've ever done in their life to talk to these boys. They're 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And 
they have, they're just, they have these giant hearts and they really, really believe that they are fighting for, which they are, they're, they're fighting for, um, the existence of the Jewish people. Like it's a, it's, it's an existential war. It's a war for survival. And they really, they really, they understand that. Um, and all of them are, you know, none of them want to be, uh, want there to be casualties. They're all trying their hardest to minimize casualties, right. despite what everybody else says <laughs> about it. The yeah. lengths that the Israeli army goes to minimize casualties have been said to be more drastic than any other army in modern history. I mean, they they sac they risk, they put their own soldiers at risk to possibly save civilians on the other side in ways that, you know, could be really advantageous for their enemies. Um, and that's how sensitive they are um, to that and uh, to, to, you know, to any life uh, being lost. They, they really, 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 really value life and living. And, and uh, they, they feel, they all feel like this is just like another battle that the Jews have gone through, you know, right. kind of always kind of struggling to survive, especially in that region. And they've fought so many battles and this is, and this is one more. So yeah, I think I think when you meet with soldiers, you just have a diametrically opposite experience as what you hear in the media about the army. Yeah. Why do you think the media portrays something different? Mm. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of practical reasons, and there's a lot of ideolo ideological reasons. Practically. Okay. Israel is probably the only country in the Middle East where journalists can just walk in and shoot and say whatever they want. Mm. You know, these other, Israel is surrounded by tyrannies. You know, it's largely theocratic states, right? And um, it's not really that easy for Western journalists to just go cover these areas, right? They just don't have access, right? Right. Um, I mean, you try to walk into Lebanon and Hezbollah is going to, you know, take your passport, right? Mm. Or, or Gaza. Um, you know, but not to mention other, other countries in the, in the region as well. And so with Israel, there's just a lot of access. Okay. So the coverage is going to, there's going to be more coverage and more criticism. And it's just, Israel's always going to be under a microscope because journalists have so much access there. Right. Um, and they can say whatever they want. There's freedom of speech in the country. They, you know, I mean, this idea that like, Zionists think that any criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic is just hilarious. Like, I'm a Zionist. I don't know any Zionists that think that. Like, we all criticize Israel. <laughs> you know, like, there's, like, I feel like Zionists are the most critical of Israel. Um, so that's, like, I think a, a practical reason, just just the sheer amount of, of, of coverage and room for different opinions and all that kind of stuff. Um, ideologically, I think the mainstream media is very, you know, they... Unfortunately, they assume a left-wing point of view, and the left-wing point of view on Israel is largely shaped and influenced by the Soviet Union, which not a lot of people know. Mm. Um, and uh, the Soviet Union's, uh, I think, uh, you know, their their position was a annihilationist position, a um, like a delegitimizing, a demonizing position, where they really want they really deliberately tried to frame Israel in a specific light. And we can get into why it had to do with the Cold War and all this kind of stuff. And they exported um, their views, their propaganda about Israel uh, all over the world in very targeted ways. I mean, they targeted specific groups in America, such as um, black nationalist groups like, um, you know, Black Panthers and, you know, a lot of these, these uh, a lot of these, um, black power groups that were like trained in the Soviet Union, you know, that kind of like went um, in a different direction than like the MLK version of, of civil rights. Right. Um, a lot of those people, you know, the, the Soviet Union just kind of like, ooh, let's get those people, you know, they took them, they brought them to the Soviet Union, they trained them in their ideology and, you know, and same with just with, with groups, progressive groups, you know, anti-war groups, they would, they would, the Soviet Union would, would target them. And then a lot of those people end up as our thought leaders today in, in academia or, you know, in, in a lot of our institutions, including media. And so I think when you assume a left-wing narrative about Israel, like, 
you're going to end up demonizing the army because you, and when I say left wing, I don't mean liberal. I mean like progressive left, you know, right, like, right. um, uh, you're, 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 you're basically regurgitating, um, decades of messaging by the Soviet Union that's been incredibly successful. That's, <clears throat> it's always fascinating to hear about the impact of the Soviet Union, even though the Soviet Union no longer exists. Right. <laughs> and that, that goes to show you, like, you can kill people, you can't kill ideas. Mm -hmm. And, um, but people can change, right? People can abandon ideas and, mm -hmm. and move on. But someone picks up a book, I never heard this idea. And they just run with it, mm -hmm. or someone with authority, like a professor, tells you this new idea that you didn't know. But guess what? This is actually the truth. Start right. adapting it, uh, adopting uh, the ideology to your life, and now you see it everywhere, right? Um, yeah, I think. I think what's interesting about the whole Israel uh, and Jewish thing, honestly, is the conspiracies. Because they they seem silly to me. Like which conspiracies? Uh, they control everything. Oh, and right. Yeah, like the, the classic. The classic conspiracies. conspiracies. Okay, yeah. And, and so, let's say I know nothing about Judaism. Mm -hmm. Let's just say. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I know nothing about Israel. But the, when they say uh, this industry and they point out, I don't know, these executives. Right. Right, so they they're in these positions. They're so all that, Jewish, and they're all Jewish. <laughs> so that must mean that they control everything. And so I'm like, well, that isn't necessarily because you're what you're trying to say is that they're conspiring. <laughs> totally. Or do do they just happen to all work in the same? That be, you know, there are different people from different demographics for whatever reason do well in certain areas right. versus others. Or are overly represented in certain Overly, overly represented areas. in others. That doesn't mean that they're all conspiring to keep other people out. Mm -hmm. It just means that they're overrepresented, uh, overrepresented for whatever reason. Maybe there's more interest in it. Mm -hmm. You know, do we, do we think that uh, the Asians are conspiring in STEM? <laughs> it's like, oh, the right. Indians, they're all conspiring to take over right. IT. Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Like, I'm just using the same logic. Yeah. The existence of them being there mm. doesn't mean that they're conspiring yeah. to go against other people. Sure. And and if anything, because if I'm if I'm correct, um, Jewish people are the, was it the smallest demographic of people in in the states, or one of the smallest? Um, well, I mean, I know that Jews in the states are like less than two percent of the population. Okay. Yeah, and responsible. I mean, they're. There's more hate crimes against um, Jewish people than any other group, and right. not even, not even just per capita. Like um, there's more religious hate crimes against Jews than any other religion, mm. and then per capita there's more hate crimes. So like, um, for example, like a Jew in America is twice as likely to be targeted as a black person mm. if you adjust for population, which is insane because you don't see any Jewish Lives Matter protests, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, and there's only 14 million Jews in the world, and there's like what 1.4 billion Christians, 1.3 billion Muslims. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, that's a lot of power to have with a tiny group of people, <laughs> especially when they're all in the U.S. and Israel. Basically, there's not very many Jews left in the rest of the world. Right. Well, that's, and this might sound kind of weird, but when I hear people t saying stuff like that. Even if it wasn't Jews, if, when I hear certain people talk about other demographics who are mm -hmm. doing better, and they're saying, "Well, they're conspiring," you know, they they they, they take that stretch, yeah. it comes off as jealousy. Yeah, envy. Right. It seems very envious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you guys shouldn't be in that position right. of power. We should. Right. Right. And I I see this sometimes. I see with like the black nationalists. It's like, oh, these white people are in these positions of power. It's like, because you want to be in it. Right. Like, it sounds very envious. And so they, they uh, construct some conspiracy right. to keep black people out. Like, it's the same, as I'm saying, it, absent of Jews, it's the same line of thinking. Yeah. And it's illogical right. 
at least in, in my head, like that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense if it's Jews, blacks, whites, whatever. It doesn't make any sense because that people don't coordinate that well. <laughs> right. There's something when there's a group of people who are successful, whether it's like Asians in Harvard, right, or right. Jews in Hollywood or something, um, people can't really accept that the success could be uh, achieved in any sort of pure way, right? Like if somebody is successful, they must have stolen that success from somebody else, right? And I think this really speaks to how anti-Semitism works. I think sometimes it can be a little difficult actually to identify because unlike other forms of hatred, mm -hmm. like most other forms of hatred, um, they punch down. It's what, what, what it's called. Like, you know, um, black people are inferior, right? Mm -hmm. Or gay people are inferior. They're less than human. And you see that with, with uh, anti-Semitism as well. Obviously, you see, you know, Jews portrayed as pigs or vermin or rats. Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, anti-Semitism punches up, meaning Jews are, like you said, they are controlling the levers of power, right? There's this, you know, they control the banks, they control government, they make the wars, they, they are responsible for immigration, whatever. Um, and... This is fundamentally a conspiracy. Right. So at its core, anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory. And so I think it can be kind of easy to fall into that, especially now, like with, with people on the right, a lot of people on the right or even formerly on the left have been so like blackpilled because of COVID and stuff like that. And so many things that we were told were, was a conspiracy turned out to not be a conspiracy at all. Right. I think it can be kind of easy to slip into like anti-Semitic tropes because, you know, that's kind of the shape that this form of hatred has, has taken for thousands of years, you know, whether it was Jews were poisoning the wells or Jews were you know, um, killing children and drinking their blood to make matzah all the way to, you know, yeah. Israelis are, you know, we're, or, uh, harvesting the organs of Palestinians or whatever, you know, I mean, it's, it, 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 I mean, you can't have enough organs, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is, is that there's like these classic anti-Semitic tropes and they're just kind of like resurrected in these new ways over the years. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's no longer the Jewish lobby, it's the Israel lobby, right? And people will, people who consider themselves anti-Zionist, they're like, oh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Zionist. But if you actually listen to them, or even if you look at these protests and you see some of their signs and stuff, they take all of the like medieval classic anti-Semitic tropes and they just replace the word Jew with like Zionist or Israelis. Right. So now it's no longer like the Jews that are, you know, responsible for all the evils in the world, it's the Israelis. It's the Zionists, right? We need to destroy Zionism. We need to eradicate Zionism. And that's because anti-Semitism, it just kind of morphs throughout the ages because it's a conspiracy. So it fits the needs of a given society. So if a given society is, you know, suffering from a, a disease and they, they need, they, you know, or a plague or something like that, and they need a scapegoat, the Jews are right there, right? The right. Jews are kind of like the scapegoat in society. So whatever whatever ills society is dealing with, they, they, they can pin it, they can blame it on the Jews. And that's just been part of, that's what anti-Semitism is, you know, right. it's, that's how it operates. It's, it's fascinating to, to watch the, um, actually, you, you brought up something very interesting to me because I noticed this too, especially like you said, COVID. COVID was like a big, uh, red pill or black pill, depending on how you look at it, mm -hmm. for a lot of people, where they realize that the media lies about major narratives all the time. Mm -hmm. So then they they did the next illogical thing. So the first thing is you shouldn't trust the media mm -hmm. just blindly. Mm -hmm. But the equally, you shouldn't dismiss the media wholly as being as lying to you. Mm -hmm. The real answer is that you're supposed to verify. You're supposed to think critically right. about what is saying said to you, whether you agree with it or right. disagree with it. So what I've seen is people become very black pill about the media. Mm -hmm. Then they say anything where the mainstream media has a position, we're just going to take the opposite to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. because the mainstream media, while I'm not a huge fan, 
they don't lie about everything. Well, of course. And a lot of it is not even like they're lying. It's more just like they're like missing context or right. something like that. So they're not telling like the full story. Exactly. Know? Sometimes they are just blatantly lying. But Sometimes they're lying. You know, good people on both sides. Mm-hmm. They were, they were, well, that, that was missing context. And because yeah. of the missing context, they were shaping a narrative yeah. that he was implying something that he wasn't. Mm-hmm. And they did that for years. So, okay. But it doesn't mean that everything that they do is like that. You know, I, I remember some some rando was like, the mainstream media would never report on this. And I don't watch the main, they said, I don't watch the mainstream media. The mainstream media would never report on this. So I replied to him and said, how would you know they would never report on this? You just said you don't watch the mainstream media. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I didn't even think about that. You yeah. know, it's that kind of like, right. you they, don't even, yeah. they don't even know. They just immediately take the position. Yeah. If CNN printed it, it's right. a lie. And I'm like, CNN prints everything that's mm-hmm. going going on. Mm-hmm. You can criticize how they frame it, right. or uh, or if it's something that's not sensational, like a murder happened here. All right, well they're going to say a murder happened here. Like there's not right. much you can really do with it. Right. So what's interesting is that it seemed overwhelmingly that the media was taking the position of Israel. Um, I, like I a pro-Israel want, position? Yeah, like more uh-huh. of the pro-Israel position. That's uh-huh. what I actually want to say. They were taking more of the pro-Israel position. Were there people in the media who weren't? Sure. right. There are, there are always mm-hmm. going to be two sides to it. But it seemed like it was more of a pro-Israel position. And then I saw those same people said, if they lied about COVID, if they lied about George Floyd, they must be lying about Israel. Mm-hmm. And so they just went the, the counter-narrative for everything. And I'm like, I don't think that's what you're really supposed to do. I think you're supposed to think critically mm-hmm. about what is going on. Is this true? Is it partially true? Is the pro-Israel narrative part of the story? It's not necessarily false, but there's other parts to mm-hmm. it. Like it just like zero critical thinking when it came to it. And then I saw some of those same people fall for the very tropes because over a period of time, because it's a big story for a period of time. And the more they go down the, you know, the internet tunnel, mm-hmm. uh, the internet rabbit hole, they just fall deeper and deeper into these tropes. And I'm just like, everybody's being emotional and illogical at the same time mm. when it comes to this particular story. So I, I completely, I've, I've, I've watched certain people, I'm not naming names, but I've watched certain people who just went the counter narrative just cause. Well, that's interesting that you that you framed it this way because you know I used to work for a media watchdog nonprofit and we mm-hmm. monitored the mainstream media for anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, and until October seventh, I would argue that the mainstream media, with few exceptions, has been overwhelmingly across the board since the, I would say probably since like starting in the 70s, kind of a little bit in the 80s, and then like really full scale in the 90s, and then just get just like progressively worse and worse and worse and worse at like an exponential rate, anti-Israel. The yeah, mainstream media right. hates Israel. <laughs> they, and, but, that's, and, but that's what makes October 7th interesting. Right, but then on October 7th, right. So then on October 7th, for the first time, there was overwhelming support. Um, compassion for what Israel had just been through. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. There was some people who I saw that, you know, had been so red pilled or black pilled that they were like, well, this doesn't add up here. There must be something going on. It's got to be like a false flag or Mm -hmm. Netanyahu's a globalist. He must have orchestrated this. There was so many things like that. And what was really disturbing to me about them, and that's fine if they're in good faith, and obviously this was like the biggest, like the ma- probably the biggest intelligence failure in Israel's history, right, right up there with the, the Yom Kippur War. So obviously everybody should be asking those questions about how we let this happen. But the thing is, is those questions were being answered. Like we know a lot about how this actually happened. We're going to know a lot more once the war is o- over, but we've already kind of started piece to get, piecing together a lot of things. You can even talk about them here if you want. But the people who were like, oh, this must be like a false flag and stuff, it's like they just weren't 
listening to what, what people were actually revealing because they're not in that space. Right. They don't listen to Israeli media. They don't speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. They're not in, you know, they don't, uh, re, you know, they're not, they're not looking at, you know, FDD or Middle East Forum or these think tanks and these nonprofits and these research institutes that do this kind of stuff, that are analyzing this kind of stuff and putting out reports about what they've found and stuff like that. So they were coming up with all these crazy things. And it's like, <laughs> we actually are like, there's actually like things that we already know about this that you just you just kind of don't know and because you don't know you're just deciding what you think must be the conclusion right um and you know there was somebody who and i'm not going to name names either but there was somebody who i i very much value as like you know a, a, a narrative breaker who does not go with the mainstream and his first inclination was to be like well how did this happen so he put somebody on his show who's an Israeli, who's very much in, you know, the, the health freedom movement, like we all are when it comes to COVID. And I guess because of that, because she's like, I, you know, Israel is a small country, so there's not that many Israelis that are part of this movement. So she was on this show and, and, and um, you know, she was saying things about how, like, it's very weird. There was like a stand down order and, you know, people, uh, you know, Border Patrol was was told to leave, uh, you know, the Gazan border right before. So the Israeli government must have known, all, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then she said, um, and I know this because I was on board. I was I was a part of border control. I was on Ga I was I was stationed on the border of Gaza twenty five years ago. This mm. is what she said, pretty much verbatim. And the person interviewing her, because again, he's not in this space. He doesn't know a lot. He's like, oh, okay, okay. Somebody like me, I'm like, 25 years ago, there was no border with Gaza 25 years ago. That is a lie. <laughs> like, that is impossible. So, like, you know, but because people get in these spaces that they just don't know a lot about, that would be really easy to miss. And then as soon as you know that somebody's lying about that, you've caught them in a lie, you're like, well, then how, how credible are they with their other theories? And I don't know, people just, people love to get into this space. They really do. They love to talk about the Israel stuff and the anti-Semitism stuff, but nobody ever thinks like, you know, there's actually been a lot of people that have been like looking into this for like a long time. Mm -hmm. There might be a lot more that like we already know that you're just acting like nobody knows. So why, why would someone like this person lie? Which is probably like a really hard question to, to answer. Uh, probably she herself is, is, is blackpilled and probably believes it was a government psyop and she just needed something to lend, lend credibility to that. So she said she was on the border 25 years. She, you know what I mean? Yeah. She probably, so she probably just wanted to seem credible because you need to, uh, you know, assume some sort of credibility if you're going to make that claim. So she was just like, oh, I was, I was there. So I know, I know how to, I know how the border operates. Right. Um, well, this actually, and, and this brings me to my opinions on Israel, Gaza are very limited mm -hmm. because I recognize I'm ignorant about mm -hmm. it. Why? Because I don't have any real connection to that part of the world. I'm here in the United States. Right. And so I know I'm not the only one who has zero connection with Israel or Gaza and has very little knowledge as to the history behind how we even got to this point. And so I don't say a whole lot, but it, it seems like, it's not seems like, it is. Everyone becomes a subject matter expert in a matter of hours about everything. Right. Um, and, and I'm like, I think that is the wrong way of going. Like everyone's trying to, I want to say like everyone's trying to find the truth, but it, that's not the case. Everyone's trying to find where they fit in any particular narrative. They're trying to figure out, is this my bias? Or uh, not even what's true, what feels right. Mm. And, and, I, and the reason I say that is because so many people have trouble acknowledging when they're wrong that I don't think they're seeking truth. Mm. And so I can easily say, I could be absolutely wrong about this because I have no idea, I'm ignorant when it comes to this particular topic on many aspects of it. But the thing that I know, which is one of the, the articles I wrote for the New York Post, is that you cannot 
t convince me that you're a freedom fighter as you're paragliding into a music festival of the most PC people ever, right? Just a bunch of new age hippie type people, right. and they're my people, who are just dancing and having a good time, and you're murdering them. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell me you're fighting freedom if you accept that as a target, mm -hmm. right? They didn't, they didn't fly into a base, mm -hmm. and then you can maybe make some sort of argument that they were fighting people on equal footing right. who are armed. They're fighting people who are clearly unarmed at a music festival. You can't tell me you didn't hear the music. <laughs> right and and that to me in that one instance is not to say the entire thing or everybody who's in, in Palestine is bad but in that moment you cannot tell me that Hamas is good right right and if and if I heard the same story about the US military paragliding in while uh, while Afghanis are having a celebration and they just shot and killed everybody I would like the U.S. military is wrong in this instance, right? Because the behavior is wrong, right. and and so that's that's like that's been my general stance. You're having a hard time convincing me that Hamas is this holy, great, freedom-fighting force when their targets were all soft targets, mm. when their targets were innocent people who are unarmed. If you if you try to convince me that they tried to take over a government building, go into a military base, or something of that nature then I would kind of understand, but I, I just, I have a real hard time accepting this particular narrative about Hamas. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and also I think you also in, in, intuitively, I mean, you wrote an article about the, the ceasefire protesters that were shutting down bridges in New York and airports in Chicago and everything, and how, you know, you just, you know, regardless of what you know about the conflict, you went to intuitively understand that preventing innocent people from getting to where they need to go is an immoral thing to do. Right. That your cause does not supersede a pregnant woman's need to get to a hospital, no matter what it is. Even more so, you blocking a highway does not stop, let, let's say, the genocide, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop the genocide right thousands upon thousands of miles away like you're disrupting us and you're hoping uh by osmosis somehow uh, the government will make israel a sovereign nation do something about whatever it's doing right. and, and it, to me it's just it's such a reach mm -hmm. like i can't even i can't if i was someone who's open i can't get on board right. with that based off of that action, because that doesn't make any sense to anybody who's thinking. Right. You know? When you understand what the, when you, when you understand that the free Palestine movement is really not about freeing Palestine, right? then it makes sense why all these people are doing all this crazy stuff. When you see that people are, you know, shouting for ceasefire, that they're also shouting for intifada. Right. Those kind of directly contradict each other. <laughs> Either you want a ceasefire or you want an intifada. Uh, um, I know, just don't know what intifada means. Oh, so. yeah, it means violent <laughs> resistance. It can mean nonviolent resistance because the technical definition is just uprising. Right. But the only time it's ever been carried out in the context of Israel has been incredibly violent. Mm -hmm. um, violent, you know, suicide bombings, stabbings, vehicular rammings, um, Molotov cocktails, you know. Um, it's been these these a uh, few different uh, periods in Israeli history where uh, Palestinian Arabs, you know, kind of um, get into these these um, frenzies where they just carry out uh, relentless acts of violence against innocent uh, is Israeli civilians. Um, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, there's so much to tap into there with these with these protests and just the hypocrisy. But I mean, th these people don't care about Palestine. Palestine. They care about. Um, they, they they are from this again. They are in. They don't realize it, but they are influenced by the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and they come. They are the same people, you know, that are screaming about trans rights and George Floyd, and you know, I mean, they they come from a, a neo Marxist, you know, deconstructive, decolonializing, you know, narrative, mm -hmm. and because they because they see Israel wrongly and falsely, and I can tell you why it's wrong and false, as a 
Western, white, that's just horrendous that they think Israel's like a white country, but um, white Western colonial, uh, mm. uh, colonialist entity. They believe that it's rotten to the core, just like they believe America is rotten to the core. And they believe that, you know, it, 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 that any action against anybody within the country is, is justified. Right. Um, now, I mean, the idea, I mean, the whole idea that Israel is white, Western, and colonialist is abjectly false, if you understand history, which is pretty simple. If, if you want to get into it, we can. Then yeah, we know that that's not true. But the reason why people think that is because that's how the Soviet Union characterized Israel in, mm. in the 60s. But um, uh, when Israel was reestablished in 1948, aside from its Arab neighbors, the world was largely rejoicing um, because people understood that what this signified was an, an incredible rebellion against colonialism. This was a people, an indigenous people. How do we know they're indigenous? Well, there's tons of uh, scientific, uh, archeological, uh, DNA-based evidence that links, uh, that links Jews to this region. But really, all you have to know is that Jews are from Judea. Judea, Judea is Israel. Jews are from Judea. The French are from France. The Arabs are from Arabia. Mm -hmm. The Arabs are not indigenous to Israel. The Arabs are indigenous to the Arabian Peninsula. And then the seventh century with the Islamic con conquest, they, they spread out and they conquered all of the Middle East and vast swaths of land. And they is Islamified those, those territories and they became Muslim lands. But that didn't happen until those conquests. That doesn't mean that there, you know, there wasn't, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that there, there wasn't, you know, various religions that had moved in their own accord to different places. But when we're talking about indigeneity, it's pretty simple. Jews are from Judea. And um, when Israel was established, you know, people saw this as like finally the uh, indigenous um, inhabitants of this land that had been pushed out and exiled for thousands of years by all these foreign inv invaders, right? Like from the Babylonians to the Assyrians to the Romans to the Crusaders and the Ottomans, all of these, these empires, these, these foreign empires that came um, and conquered this land and pushed out the Jews. And yet, you know, and yet they maintained a constant presence throughout thousands of years, sometimes very, very small because most of them had been pushed out at other times big when they were finally controlling the land. Mm -hmm. um, but they never, they were never gone. They never left. And they always came back because it is in Jewish blood. It is in our DNA. It is in our, the Torah. Jews pray, you know, to Jerusalem. We say next year to next year in Jerusalem at every Passover Seder. If you read the Torah, so many of the stories and, and many of our hol holidays are about the return to Israel. And, you know, I mean, um, it's such a fundamental part of Jewish identity. And that is why like poll after poll shows that anywhere from like 80 to 90, 95% of Jews are Zionists in the sense that they consider the connection to Israel an important part of their identity. Hmm. Um, so when people say they're just anti-Zionist and not anti-Semitic, well, if 90% of Jews are Zionists and you're just anti-Zionist, then you're anti 90% of Jews. That's kind of anti-Semitic, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, but but anti-Semites want to decouple Zionism from Judaism and pretend like they're they're not connected. But um, Anyway, kind of, it's, there's so many tangents. I always uh, go on when I'm talking about this, but but so but so yeah, the world largely understood this that this was an indigenous people reclaiming their homeland, right? And um, and so the idea that they're a, a, a col like you know a, a colonializing nation is ridiculous. There was a lot. There was waves of migration from um, from Europe for sure especially in like the 1800s when pogroms got got really out of control in Europe. They had um, the like, you know, little random massacres of Jews all over and they weren't safe. And so large amounts started, um, started emigrating to Israel in the 1800s and throughout the 1900s. 
But at that time, Arabs started emigrating to the, the region because Jews were building up this land that was largely like swamp land, you know, it was controlled by the Ottomans at that point. Um, and then later by the British, and they were building up the land. They were farming the land. They were buying the land from absentee landowners from Syria and building it up. And so that drew a lot of Arab immigration. So you had a lot of Jews coming. You had Jews that were already there. You had Arabs that were already there. And then you had all these Jews and Arabs coming as well. Right. Um, and a lot of those Jews, especially after World War II, were, you know, right before Israel was established, they came and they're refugees. They're not colonizers. These were Jews that were fleeing persecution. Mm. Um, so to call them like settler colonialists is so disrespectful. Like these are literally refugees seeking asylum in a land that they believe that they will be safe in and belong, you know, and belong. Um, they didn't come with some, you know, like uh, with anything except the clothes on their backs, you know, to rebuild. And, and that's what they did. Um, not to mention close to a million Jews were, were ethnically cleansed from Middle Eastern lands um, in the 40s. And they all, they all went to Israel, not all of them, a good portion of them, some went to France, um, but most of them came to Israel. And that goes to the other lie about Israel being a white country. In reality, these, in reality the, the more than 50% of Jews are from are Mizrahi or Sephardi, meaning they're from the Middle East or uh, North Africa. Mm -hmm. So they're indistinguishable from the Arabs, like aesthetically. They're just as brown as their, as their Arab brothers and sisters. Um, but again, we're impo you know, the, the people in the West impose this I idea, uh, like as if it's like America or something, right? Um, so much so that they call Israel like a white supremacist country. Can you imagine Jews being lumped into the same category as their oppressors? Right. You know, suddenly it, Jews, the biggest victims of white supremacists, and now they're being called white supremacists. Um, how ironic that during the Holocaust, six million Jews were exterminated for the very reason that they were not considered white. They were not Aryan. Right. And now we're being demonized because we are considered white? Which one is it? Are we white or are we not white? Either way, it's a lose-lose situation. We're demonized if we're white. We're demonized if we're not white. But at the end of the day, um, you know, Israel is just not, if you go there and you walk around, it's not going to look like a white country, I promise you. Right. Um, you know, so I mean, phew, so much, so many, so many falsehoods, so much history <laughs> to get into. Well, listen, you're talking to the black face of white supremacy. So, <laughs> you know, it makes just as much sense. Yeah. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I thought was funny Obviously, not because of October seven. October seven is not funny, but the re, the response. So it wasn't the response to October seventh, but it was the response to the response of October seventh by leftist Jews who were shocked that leftists don't like Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh yeah. And I was like, oh, you clearly weren't paying attention mm -hmm. um, because. I knew that, right. and if you understand the left, this is why understanding the ideology is really important, mm -hmm. and why bandwagoning what's in the trend, the trending thing in the moment, isn't always the best move because mm -hmm. then you forget you're you're aligning yourself with certain people, um, where right now sometimes people that like want to kill you, right, <laughs> right, or have no problem with you dying, mm -hmm. and it's just not your turn. Right. right. See, it was Black Lives Matter. Hey, join us. Right. Black Lives Matter. You're just not our target right now. Mm -hmm. October 7th happens. Israel's in the news. Now all the people, all the activists, I, I wrote about um, Patrice Colors going to Harvard and doing this panel talking about how um, ba basically anti-Zionist views and, and how Israel needs to be wiped off the, the map. Yeah. Uh, wiped off the map. And no one paid attention to that, right? And they get, they just gave her money. Yeah. And oh, it's so true. It's so true. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. First of all, the Black Lives Matter, which was originally the movement for black lives, had as one of its like demands or bullet points on its website to free Palestine. Right. Like, what in the world does that have to do with <laughs> civil rights for black people in America? They had trans rights. Right. 
same thing. It's just it's a um, blueprint. But the thing is, is they had no other country on there, right? Like mm-hmm. it's always just Israel, not free Tibet, right? Not free the Uyghurs, not free the Kurds, mm. not free free uh, the Armenians. Always Israel, and it's because. As Patrice Coulers and Alicia Garza said, they are trained Marxists. What does that mean? That means that they are trained in Soviet Union ideology. And the Soviet Union, um, anti-Zionism was a fundamental component of Soviet Union ideology. Why? Because after World War II, when Israel was reestablished and declared independence, there was a question as to whether it was going to ally with the Soviet Union or ally with America, right? This was right after the war, so the Cold War was just starting, right? And there were these two superpowers that emerged and they were, you know, mortal enemies, right? And everybody had to take a side and, and America and, and, and both powers were trying to claim their, their stakes throughout the world, you know, in, in South Asia and in Africa and in, you know, the Middle East. They all wanted their fronts, you know, either against communism or against capitalism, right? right. And Israel was going to be a very important front in the Middle East. Whoever got that, whoever, you know, whoever side Israel ended up on, that was very important. And people thought Israel was going to ally. A lot of people thought Israel was going to ally with the Soviet Union because there was a lot of socialistic elements in Israeli society, uh, like kibbutzim. There are these little communes. They're very fundamental to the to the culture there. Is still today, um, and uh, and even you know David Ben Gurion, the, the 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 first prime minister of Israel. Um, he uh, he, I think he was a self declared socialist, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, but Israel didn't. Israel allied with the U.S. And this was a massive blow to the Soviet Union. Uh, so what did the Soviet Union start to do? They started to arm, arm their enemies, all their Arab enemies. They started to train, you know, they, they trained the PLO, like Mahmoud Abbas, the current president of the Palestinian Authority. He, you know, wrote his, he wrote his dissertation in, in, uh, he went to, um, to a university in, in, in Russia and wrote his dissertation there about Holocaust denial, no that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, and, but the thing is, is that the world was largely sympathetic to Israel. Like they, they, the world was, you know, one of the biggest genocides in history had just taken place, right? We discussed how, you know, people viewed the state of Israel as this like beautiful example of, you know, like, um, uh, uh, indigeneity, you know, um, shining through and being, being victorious over the, uh, you know, foreign invaders and everything. And so the Soviet Union understood that, like, in order to win this fight in this, on this front, that they had to do more than just, like, arm the enemies. And they did what they do best, which is they began a massive propaganda campaign, a massive delegitimization campaign. And all these things that you hear about, like, Zionism is racism and, you know, or, like, Israel does not have a right to exist. All of this stuff came from the Soviet Union. This, these were, like, slogans that the Soviet Union created. Mm. They put them on posters, in magazines, in movies. They, uh, you know, and, and they distributed these materials far and wide across the globe in very targeted ways, like I told you, to specific groups based on what each group's goal was. Um, you know, like South Africa was a big, uh, was, was, was one um, region where the Soviet Union heavily targeted um, um, with, with this type of propaganda. And one thing that, one way in which they did this is they appropriated literally appropriated, I'm not using that word um, figuratively, they literally took Nazi propaganda, like kind of like the posters that everybody's familiar with and some of the curriculum and, and messaging, and they just replaced the word Jew with Zionist. They used the same exact materials, mm-hmm. and they just distributed that worldwide. And so a lot of these people 
When they were trained in this neo-Marxist ideology, anti-Zionism was a component of that. It is something that the, that the Soviet Union tacked on. They're like, this is part of our totalizing ideology, you know? Right. It really ramped up, rep, ramped up up after the 60s and it culminated, this, this Soviet Union campaign, it culminated in this famous, this infamous resolution in the United Nations, the 1975 Zionism is Racism resolution. The Soviet Union had been trying to push this bill through again and again for like 10 years. And finally they were successful. They pushed this bill, this, this resolution through, excuse me, this you know, non-binding ridiculous, you know, like (laughs) means absolutely nothing, totally symbolic, you know, resolution that said Zionism is racism. And it's, you know, it was, it was, it's no longer, you know, it was, it was uh, repealed after the Cold War ended and and the Soviet Union fell and everything. Right. But, uh, but so these people that, you know, it's just, it's all sloganism and they don't even know where it comes from. They don't even know. I mean, they did this, they did this poll, uh, like 250 students where they asked them, They took 250 students that had taken part in protests where the chant from the river to the sea was used, and they asked them if they knew what river and what sea, and less than half of them knew. Right. And when they asked asked them, well, take a guess, some of them actually had kind of good guesses. Like, some of them guessed, like, the Nile River. I'm like, oh, that's actually a good guess, like, if you don't know. But then some of them were like, the Atlantic Ocean, or like, I don't know, just like crazy stuff. And then they asked some other questions. Some of them believed that Yasser Arafat was like the first prime minister of Israel, like when, I, when in reality he was like the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Like they knew nothing. Right. These people knew nothing. They're just jumping on a bandwagon and they think it's some organic human rights oriented campaign in support of the Palestinians. They have no idea that it's like, a f- like state-sponsored propaganda campaign that really ramped up in the '60s and has now, you know, that, that managed to really infiltrate our institutions, like especially academia, because all those people that were neo-Marxists are now teaching in in academia and they're imparting all their views, um, all their you know transhumanist views to you know to all you know millennials and Gen Zers. Right. Well, I I knew. Because based off of like how they, how they frame stuff, and I, I recognize that th- there's always a dichotomy as far as oppress and oppressor. Mm. And so they, they see it with everything because to yeah. them, everything is about a power dynamic. Right. And that's how they're able to sell literally everything. Uh-huh. So that is Marxism. Right. That is Marxism. It, it is identity politics. It is DEI. It is critical race theory. It's all right. of it. And... And for the, so there are the people who are, they know what it is. They're Marxists, right? We're not talking about those people. We're talking about the people who generally mean well. They might be more left-leaning. Maybe they're just liberal. But they're just going with the wave. Mm. And they don't realize that this isn't, this just isn't, this isn't just some way of living or uh, you know, just some movement that organically happened. This is a, I call it a, a non-theistic religion, right? And they don't, they don't realize that they're part of a, it's, it's a religious faction. Yeah, um, like a cult or something. Right, very much so. And you're either with them or against them. Mm-hmm. Now, they'll take useful idiots to help propel them, right? You can walk alongside them. Uh, for their march and make it look like it's bigger than it really is mm-hmm. and that there's more of them than there is and they they're masterful at propaganda mm-hmm. I think the the most interesting part is They've affected the minds of the elites mm-hmm. And it's like the unofficial religion of the elite class. Mm-hmm. I was talking to um, Someone who reached out to me his son went to Exeter uh, private private school which is the top private school in the country, and you know, streamline those is kids. Is it really? To, is it? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and and all those kids they streamline into Ivy League schools and so yeah. on and so forth. DEI is all in it. They have classes on it, right? In preparation to send them to college. So it's not even that they show up in Harvard one day and they learn about. Right. No, it's K through twelve. They they're they're yeah. already prepped. They're already for indoctrinated. It. Yeah. They're already indoctrinated. And these are the leaders of our world mm-hmm. in the future. Um, so I, I don't think people understand how deep it really is. I, it's so true. It's and, so true. 
and they just go along with it because they see some brown people who are getting bombed mm -hmm. by some white looking people. So it must be the same thing like George Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, that's the, um, well, Americans have this, they, they do this thing where they project yes. race <laughs> are they, on they, everything. <laughs> yeah. Like the, like the whole like racial constructs that we have here in America, they like project it onto other places, but yeah. you can't do that because not everything is like black, white. No, <laughs> but it's very much so. The thing I, I learned is very much so culture. Oh, no doubt. So, for example, no people would be like, oh, when you go to Europe, they, they treat black people wrong. I was like, well, when I would go and I would be like, I'm from America, I'd get hugs. <laughs> like, I'd get people who were excited. Really? In Europe? Yeah. Not everywhere in Europe, though. I've been to a bunch of places. And in France? I've only been to Paris. I'll give I'll give you that. Did they like you in Paris though? I only I didn't uh, I did the typical tour stuff. Okay. So I didn't you know I, I was served on everything was generally yeah, yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, but in, in other parts I I never experienced anything. I, yeah. I was in Turkey, and uh, I was at a Turkish bathhouse. I went to get a massage, oh. and she was like, "Where are you from?" I was like, "America." She's like, "I love America," <laughs> and she just gave me this big hug. And it was like, yeah. the weirdest thing. Yeah. Um, now. Would they be doing that if I was from Western Africa? I don't mm. know, right? And that, that's a cultural difference. I've right. heard the same thing from, from uh, someone I know where we went to Italy and they looked at him kind of funny and they were talking to him and he, he's like, I'm from America. He's like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> like they were trying to figure it out? Right, because right. He, because he was black, presumably? Right. Okay. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's not, it's not the same. Yeah. It's no, not no. the same. Mm -mm. Um, it is very much so culture oriented. Mm -hmm. And this is just in Europe, but all over the world. Yeah. It's very much so culture oriented. It may be even nationally oriented. You can talk to Asians as far as how they feel, you know, someone from uh, China, how they feel about the Japanese or Korea, mm -hmm. how they feel about uh, the Japanese. Like, there, there's so many different I know. <laughs> things but going here, on. But here in America, I mean, I wrote an article about Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, she made a number of comments a couple of years ago about the Holocaust that were just so despicable. And one of them was about how the Holocaust was not about race because it was white on white crime. Right. Insanity. <laughs> like that is, a, that is such a um, perfect example of... Americans projecting the American construct of race onto another place. Right. Like our idea of race in America is black, white, but that is not the only racism out there. Like that is one form of racism. And the Nazis considered the Jews a separate race. Their whole um, annihilationist, uh, exterminationist ideology was based on this idea that the Jews were a separate race. That, uh, it can't get any more about race than that. Right. You know, like that <laughs> word was like embedded in like all of like the Nazis materials that they were, you know, they were teaching the, the youth. So you're saying it wasn't so. just white people grieving, uh, <laughs> agree, um, have white people grievances and, you know, yeah. I, I, I remember that and I was like, ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but you know, but you were, you said before all these, uh, you said something I, um, I didn't address about, you know, liberal Jews being kind of shocked at how much the left hates us after, right. after 10 7. And this is why I got involved in this nonprofit, the Jewish Leadership Project, which was, it was kind of a controversial, controversial outfit because we were calling out other Jewish organizations, which in the Jewish community, understandably, that's, you know, you don't necessarily want to like divide the Jewish community even more. We're already so small and we don't want to necessarily air our dirty laundry in public. But the Jewish Leadership Project was founded by these, these two veterans of the Jewish nonprofit world, um, Avi Goldwasser and Charles Jacobs. And for, you know, two, over two decades, they had been trying behind the scenes to get our legacy Jewish organizations, the mainstream orgs and leaders you know, such as the ADL and our, the Hillel and the, the Jew, JCRCs, the Jewish federations. These are all the like big Jewish organizations in the U.S. that have different branches, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and they were, you know, these, these two guys were trying to get them to prioritize Jewish safety and, and, and recognizing 
that the threats of anti-Semitism were not just coming from the right, from white supremacists. They were trying to, to get these organizations to prioritize Jewish safety and fighting anti-Semitism from across the political spectrum for decades, and they would not budge. And so they started Jewish Leadership Project to basically put pressure on the existing Jewish organizations to, to prioritize Jewish safety. Hmm. Um, and I think it points to the fact that Jews in America, um, they're largely liberal, not in other places, not like in Eastern Europe, like there's no liberal Jews in Eastern Europe, you know, in Israel, they're not, the majority are not liberal. Um, but in America, that is the case. And so they... They want to, we want to believe so badly that if we ally with other oppressed minorities, if we have their back when they need us, then they'll have our back when we need them. And this has been like the operating mentality of these organizations mm. for decades. And it has proven to have failed. It doesn't actually work. The Jews always end up going, going about stuff alone. And it also doesn't work because you end up excusing anti-Semitism or hatred from those camps because they're also considered an oppressed minority. And so you're like, oh, well, we have to ally with them. And then you turn a blind eye. You turn a blind eye to Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter anti-Zionism because you're like, oh, you know, it's, it's still a movement for civil rights, you know, ostensibly. And so we want to be on the right side of history we want to we want to join our our you know our black brothers and sisters and fight with them just like we did in the civil rights movement you know right. jews alongside blacks and it's like this is not the civil rights movement man black lives matter is not did was not born out of the legacy of martin luther king open your eyes these people are not for jews these people do not want like you know it's it's and it's um it's such a shame because it, we've really suffered as a result. We've, we've let these poisonous ideas that in which anti-Semitism is a component of them, we've, we've let them fester and it's gotten to the point where, like you said, it's taught in K through 12 education. Ethnic studies, which is so anti-Semitic, is like mandated in California now in public schools. And it's, you know, I mean, a lot of people are trying to fight it, but, but it's moving now to other states. This is a, this is a, vicious, vicious, um, you know, uh, radical curriculum that is, you know, in which, you know, uh, all, in which capitalism and white people and Jews are all framed as evil. And like you said, it just splits the world into opp oppressors and oppressed and that's it. And because Jews in America tend to be Ashkenazi from Eastern Europe and mm -hmm. not Mizrahi and Sephardi from the Middle East, we look white in America. And if Jews look white, and, and if we're successful, then we must be part of the oppressor class. We must, you know, and, and so that's how it is. And so you have these hierarchies of oppression. And even though Jews suffer more hate crimes, you know, more religious hate crimes than any other religious group and more hate crimes per capita than any other group, it doesn't matter. We're still put into the white oppressor class and therefore we're not deserving of the same protections of the same civil rights as other minorities. Yeah. And this is why you can't separate anti-Zionism from anti-Semitism. They're, they're so inextricably linked. And I mean, this is why, this is why people on the far right, like white supremacists and the far left are united about this issue. Like there's a reason why David Duke praises Ilhan Omar for her views about Israel. Ilhan Omar is far left. David Duke is far right, but they're both united about, about Israel because David Duke hates Jews and Ilhan Omar hates Jews, but under the guise of hating Israel. Because, let's face it, it's not okay to say I hate Jews anymore. But if you say I hate Israel, you can totally get away with that, you know? Right. You're like, oh, well, Israel is a country. You can hate a country. That's fine. You know what I mean? Like, so it's like there's certain forms of anti-Semitism that have become completely acceptable now. Um, it's, it's very clever. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're nearing the end. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I want to ask, uh, this question I ask everybody, um, are you optimistic about the future? In this regard? In general. Oh, um, 
Or if you want to be specific, you can. I don't think I'm optimistic about the future, uh, but I'm optimistic about my future. Okay. So the future, no. I, I think <laughs> um, I see the influence that technology, screens, social media, pornography, online dating is having on, you know, Gen Z and, and, and younger. And it's terrifying. Hmm. These kids don't stand a chance. No one's having sex. No one's in relationships. No one's going outside. Nobody's forming strong friendships because all of their needs are met through screens now. They have their sexual needs met through porn, and then they think they have their emotional needs met through TikTok and Snapchat and social media because they're always connected with people. But because they're not actual connections, they're still all depressed and anxious and over-medicalized. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, and, and then they get addicted to drugs and, and it's just, no, I think, see, I mean, and that's just the youth. I mean, no, I'm not that optimistic about the future, but my future, which is the only thing I can really control, um, I tend to be very optimistic. Um, sometimes it gets hard. Life is hard. And, you know, um, I'm in my thirties and I'm not married yet, you know? Um, but, uh, I think I, I'm, I try to remain like hopeful and, and, you know, I, I feel very blessed to my parents are my best friends in the world. I really lucked out there. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm optimistic for myself about things to, to come. Um, yeah. Okay. This are is, you? I'm, I'm a hopeless optimist. Yeah. Um, I, the way I see things, it's like things come in waves. There are always going to be bad times. Mm -hmm. There are always going to be bad things that happen um, across the world. But there are a lot of good people and there are a lot of good things that do happen. It's just, um, it, it's like a car crash. We're more attracted to the car crash. And, you know, we're more attracted to the negative of what's happening around us. And so it seems like the negative outweighs the positive. Um, it's just that uh, our eyes are kind of glazed over and we're just so focused on the negative. I think there are a lot of good things that are happening Personally, in my life, I think there are a lot of good things happening. I meet a lot of great people. Um, you meet a lot of great people um, who became something, even just in recent years, COVID, uh, 2020. I, I call them the people who were born out of 2020, mm. including myself. <laughs> um, yeah, there's BC and ASAP before COVID. After, there yeah. you go. <laughs> but I, I, see, I see people like that as signs that, there's still something there, right? We talked about people who are safe and feeling complacent. Mm -hmm. Well, there are people who weren't complacent, including myself, yeah. who did something. Yeah. And now they have a voice, and now they're speaking up for people mm -hmm. who are unable to speak up for themselves because um, they weren't given a platform. So I'm, I see those things as signs that there is some positivity that's in this world. Um, you know, I feel incredibly blessed to have uh, outlets like Epic Times and, and New York Post and all these different mm -hmm. outlets that give me an opportunity to write about how blocking highways is useless mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't actually help the cause. Um, whereas before, I, no one's really writing that mm -hmm. in the way that I would have wrote it. Right. So... I, I take all these different things as signs that humanity is not doomed on top of going outside. Mm -hmm. When you go outside, you meet people, you talk to people, you realize that we have a lot more in common than we do different. And, you know, you know yesterday I, I filmed a, a Breaking Bread with a Democrat strategist. Mm. And we agreed on a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a Democrat. Yeah. So, I, you know, there's, there's overlaps. There's yeah. a lot of overlaps, and there's a lot of sure. reasonable people who are out here. Yeah. Um, I just think that there's so much emphasis to make sure that we are not to work together. Yeah, no doubt. Catherine Brodsky talks about this a lot, you know, that a lot of us on different sides of the political spectrum 
we want the same things, we just disagree about how to get there. Yeah. Um, but what about like, but you don't see like the, um, the exponential uh, impact that technology is having on our lives. Uh, like you see yes. it, like, like, but do you think that that can be pulled back? Like you, you, you think it can? I think we talked about failure. I think at certain points, people realize this isn't working and they start to move differently. So like how they talk about Gen Z mm -hmm. is becoming more conservative in some respects. Why? Is it's that really true? I don't know, but I, let's say it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think there have been some studies that kind of indicate that they're mm -hmm. becoming more conservative, or at least the boys are becoming more conservative. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say it's true. Mm -hmm. I think that could be a sign of... Resistance one, to the technology. Resistance to the technology, but also looking at the world around them and seeing all these children who are growing up in single-parent homes, mm -hmm. how their parents are flawed. Right and 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 they want something better, mm -hmm. right? And now they have the information, uh, or the access to information to show them a better life. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of kids are utilizing that. Now, are they falling into TikTok and becoming crazy leftists, or you know, and cutting off their breasts because they think that they're a boy now? Yes, that exists. Um, but social media is just a tool. It's just a matter of do we show people how to use that tool properly or not. Mm -hmm. um, I am I am worried, but I think that there's an opportunity that we can learn from our failure. Mm -hmm. And because social media and, and a lot of this different technology is new, we're going to have growing pains mm -hmm. with this new technology. But I think over a period of time, we'll say this is a bit much. We're going to draw it back. Um, okay, I would like to revise my answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm not, because okay, I was kind of like focused on one area. Yeah. But I would say I'm both optimistic and pessimistic. It just depends on the actual area that we're focused okay. on. You know, I don't think, I don't think I have a grand vision for humanity. I haven't really thought, I'm ten, I tend not to speculate or make predictions mm -hmm. about things. So I don't really think about like, whether the future is going in like a good direction or the bad direction, I kind of just focus on the here and now. Mm -hmm. But like the more I'm thinking about it and listening to you, I think I think it just depends. I think some some things, like you said, will will probably get better, and the pendulum swings, and it'll swing back, and then it will swing again, and then it will swing back. Right. Other things, probably not. It just depends what you know. Yeah, I think inevitably we're always going to have progress in many areas. And I think we're going to regress in some areas. Yeah. You know? Like two steps forward, one step back. like that Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think all of that is normal. But I, I try to focus on the progress side. Yeah. You know, because I would much rather live now than 70 years ago. Oh, wow. Not me. No? Uh-uh. No, because <laughs> I don't like screens. Oh, well. Yeah, Well, see, no. here's the thing. What? You still have a, you still kind of have a choice. You don't necessarily have to. No, you don't. But I'm just like addicted like everybody else is. You know, <laughs> like it's so hard to just like not look at my phone all the time. Just like ugh, I feel my own like, you know, addiction mechanisms like kicking in. I know I have a choice, but that's like, you know, that's real. That's like trying to be on a healthy diet or something like that. Like yeah. it's, it's hard. It's very difficult. You know, I don't know. Like my parent, my mom was talking to me and she's like, yeah, man, when I was a kid, like we just went outside. Period. Right. That's it. People just go outside and the neighbor and everybody was just outside. And like, you know, like, I don't know. I feel like things were just simpler back then. And I, I feel like my parents got like the last good generation. I mean, us too, because we were like internet and like the internet was came a little bit. A little bit later. Yeah. A little bit later. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I just think things were simpler back then. I would have wanted to live in a time without online dating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, yeah. I I also just look at my parents' like photo albums when they were like trekking through Europe and that was before Europe was like built up or they were like living in India and stuff like that. And, you know, they would write letters to their parents, like actual letters, you know. And I, I don't know. I guess I'm just, I might be romanticizing it because mm -hmm. I, I know that, 
every age has its problems. My parents were also, you know, hiding under desks in preparation for, you know, like a nuclear <laughs> bomb every yeah. day. So I know every generation thinks like, you know, that the apocalypse is, is, is near. Um, but I don't know, something about the internet and, and screens and everything. It's just, it's not for me. I don't think I'm, I don't think I was built for it. I think I was, I, I was meant for like a simpler time. <laughs> I hear you. Um, one thing I'll say is the reason why online dating is difficult is because you're trying to date a stranger. <laughs> yeah. That that's why. Yeah, you can't pick up any there's no cues to pick up. Like right. you don't have any But you don't have any social proof. So for example, proof. Yeah, what do you mean? So uh let's say there's a a, a guy in your neighborhood uh -huh. that you grew up with. Uh -huh. Right? Or let's say let's say you were back in high school. You wanted to there's some guy who went to your school. You don't you know of him, you know of his family, we don't know him like that. Well, likely you can talk to somebody who does know him. Oh, right. Right? And they're like, no, actually David's a cool guy. Mm -hmm. And blah 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 blah. And I know his mom and I know his sister. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. This is how people got together back in the day. Right. And and then you felt comfortable, especially from a woman's perspective, you felt comfortable being around David because right. da if David treats you like a piece of crap. You know people that know him, mm -hmm. right? And he has to suffer consequences That's true, yeah. if he goes to you. Yeah. But if you just date David from some app, you don't know anybody no. in his circle. And nobody has to take responsibility for anything. He could be like, you know, I'm not feeling her today and just never respond to yeah. you and block you. And nothing would ever happen to, to him. Uh, so there's no repercussions for treating yeah. you like crap. Yeah, and because everybody's on online dating, nobody like sets each other up anymore. Yeah. That was like such a thing is people were always trying to like set, my mom said it was a thing at least in, you know, um, when she was younger or was that my mother? I think that was a friend's mother actually who <laughs> said me, who told me that like people were always trying to set people up. Um, and, and none of my friends do that anymore, you know, cause everybody just assumes that everybody's, you know, dating online or whatever. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I mean, I see a lot of, a lot of problems with online dating. I, I think it's, I, I mean, obviously it's been wonderful for some people, but I also think it's, um, unhealthy in certain ways but that's for a whole other episode <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's stuff I, I talk about like my my met my wife through a co-worker and it's his sister uh -huh. that's that's how we met so there's, there's a social proof and she felt comfortable talking to me because mm -hmm. her brother knew who I was so I would just my advice to you or to anybody else search through your circle because they may know somebody yeah that's all. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been, I mean, you know, I just moved to DC and it's actually wonderful. There's like events going on all the time and, yeah. you know, I go to DC Repub young Republican events and it's like 80% men and I'm like, yes. And then like <laughs> meet all of them. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were like, yes, men. Oh, oh they're a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm insanely picky. So um, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming to my house and enjoying the Indian food. Did you like the food? I loved it. Yeah, yes. you eat the rest of that naan, but I was, I was, I was stuffed. Yes, I'll, I'll eat it yeah, later. <laughs> uh, but thank you again for coming through, and um, we'll keep in touch. Yeah, thank you so much. It was wonderful.